have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Wash away, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come out your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Good morning, everybody. Good to uh, see everybody. Uh, boy, it's always neat to sit there for a little bit and then come up and around and see all you folks it really uh, it's exciting to see your faces and and uh we had a little talk last week in sunday school i think about smiling you guys want to try it there you go good 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 yeah yeah yeah, yeah i got new glasses good hey we got to thank you from the ralston's over in tanzania uh this card is actually made by was made by death child it's just as a fundraiser so make sure you check out those bulletin boards on the East Wing, uh, a lot of good, a lot of good correspondence we're having with our missionaries, and and uh, other thank yous we receive for things that the church has been doing. So it's always uh, good, good to read those. Hey, uh, Blake, make sure you read your bulletin. Uh, just to highlight a couple things, but there's a lot going on here at the church, and a lot of opportunities to to serve uh, on weekends and during the week. Uh, ben will be preaching next Sunday for us. Uh, David will be gone next weekend, so uh, Ben will be delivering our, our message uh, for next Sunday. David's starting a new Sunday school class March 6th, so please uh, take note of that in the bulletin and see him if you have any questions on that. Had a good leadership meeting yesterday, have another one planned in March. Probably going to have a fill the dumpster day here before long, too, uh, here at the church. We uh, got the Family Life Center, the, this facility, and, uh, of course, the Parsonage. Uh, ben and his family will be moving out here shortly. Uh, so we just got a lot of, lot of organization and, and cleaning up to do, so we'll make sure we publicize that. Uh, skating next Sunday afternoon. It's a Columbus Grove, but it's on State Route 65 south of Columbus Grove, so it is real easy to get to, but any questions, you can see Quentin or uh, Sarah. Uh, VBS, uh, there's a VBS corner there by David's office. It's just a way, there are packets that you can, if you want to pick up a packet and take it home and work at it, it's just a way of uh, uh, creating some of the supplies ahead of time that they're going to need uh, for VBS this summer. And uh, Mike continues to have his class on Thursday morning for Bible study here at the church at 9. So Lake of Lights is tearing down today, starting at 1. Uh, Lake of Lights is a, a program in Kenton, and, and if we have members that go and help, spend some hours helping them, you make sure you don't leave without letting them know you were there and how many hours you worked, and then, then uh, part of the uh, funds that they accumulate during the uh, holidays comes back to the church, so just a way to fund a good fundraiser. Anything else we need to mention? Okay. A uh, prayer request. Uh, Nancy asked us to pray for the family of Ed Marshall. Uh, Ed's in ICU fighting uh, pancreatic cancer, so not doing good. So be in prayer for the uh, Ed Marshall family. Anybody else we need to mention by name today? Okay. If you'll stand with me, I'll open us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, are grateful that we're here. Uh, we're just grateful. And uh, Father, help us not to, to let this opportunity we had just within the, this next uh, hour or so uh, just to truly... Uh, get all we can out of it and uh, to do all that we should be doing for you and that's just praising you through our voices and, and uh, hearing your word proclaimed and meeting around the table uh, as you instruct us to do when we meet to, to partake of the bread and the juice just to remember the sacrifice of your son and that blood that he shed for us and, and uh, that's the blood that uh, washes our sins away when we come up out of that baptistry father just a great feeling 
So we thank you for that grace. We thank you for that uh, sacrifice. But, uh, Father, it's just an opportunity for us not to let this time go by without being precious in our, in our thoughts and uh, our words and our songs. Father, we need to be crazy. There's a new song out there just to be crazy for you. Father, we, uh, we think of all the, the heroes in the Bible. You know, people probably thought they were crazy when they were doing things that you uh, led them to do. So we need to be crazy, Father. We need to be crazy for people to love and to forgive and to serve. And uh, we just lift these things in your name. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. Faith and of my honest praise, 
love my unashamed love of a holy life and of my sacrifice love my unashamed love you're calling me to lay aside worries of my day to quiet down my busy mind find a hiding place Worthy, you are worthy. Of a childlike faith and of my honest praise, of my unashamed love, of a holy life and of my sacrifice. Of my unashamed love, worthy you are worthy worthy you are worthy. My 
my Jesus, my Lord, you're the love of my life. Wherever you go, want to be by your side. No longer I, but Christ living in me, serving you for all eternity. My eyes set on you in this race that I run. No longer my ways, let your will be done. Make me a servant, my heart ever true. Clinging to the cross, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. Please be seated. When we choose to allow pride into our lives, it is built one brick at a time. It often starts small, but each additional thought or action is capable of building a tower dedicated to self. The result is often marvelous, a specimen of achievement, seemingly free from flaw or defect. But this image is built on nothing more than a foundation of self. As it climbs higher, the structure weakens, and as time passes, holes begin to appear each one a small clue alluding to the facade of the design. Bit by bit it grows, becoming unstable as it is weakened by its own attempt to outbuild its flaws. And then eventually it happens. The weight of the whole system becomes too much to contain and it collapses. Each piece of false glory crumbles to the ground, leaving us right back where we started with an opportunity to build again. Perhaps this time on a stronger foundation. Morning, church. It's nice to see so many of you out today. We've been having some really good attendance the last two or three weeks. It's really been good. I want to tell you... Uh, Pride is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, been on my mind for a couple weeks and um, just wanted to preach on it. It's usually the things I struggle with, I like to preach about. But uh, there was a lady who had went to the doctor and she said to her doctor, she said, doctor, she said, take a look at me. She said, when I woke up this morning, she said, I looked at myself in the mirror and I saw my hair was all wiry and frazzled up. My skin was all wrinkled and my skin was pasty and my eyes were bloodshot and bugging out. And she said, I had this corpse-like look on my face. She said, Doc, what's wrong with me? And the doctor looked her over for a few minutes. And he calmly said, well, he said, I can tell you one thing. He said, there's nothing wrong with your eyesight. So, <laughs> we all want to take a little pride in how we look, don't we? Pride seems to be in our DNA. On January 28, 1986, I was a junior, and I was at, at, at school, and NASA was planning to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger from Kennedy Space Center. And it was a mission that most of you have heard this name that included the school teacher, Krista McAuliffe. And she was on board this, this space shuttle. And the launch had already been delayed a few times. And on the night before the new launch date, NASA held a long conference with engineers from the Morton Thicol uh, contracting company that built the Challenger's uh, rocket motors. Alan McDonald was one of the Thicol engineers. And on the day of the launch, it was unusually cold in Florida, and it concerned McDonald because he feared that his company's O-ring seals and the Challenger's big joints wouldn't operate properly at that cold of a temperature. Now, since the boosters had never been tested below 53 degrees, McDonald recommended the launch be postponed. But NASA officials overruled McDonald, and they requested that the responsible Morton Thicol Engineering Office sign off on the decision to launch the uh, Challenger on that day. McDonald, knowing what he knew, refused to sign the request, but his boss didn't. The next morning, McDonald and millions of people around the globe watched as a mere 73 seconds into the flight and that shuttle burst into flames. 
And after the accident, a review board showed the cause of the explosion to be what McDonald had feared. The O-rings failed to hold their seal in the cold temperature. In other words, some people in the know had foreseen the exact cause of failure. So why, even with the warning, did NASA push forward and, and launch the shuttle? Alan McDaniels, or McDonald claims that NASA fell prey to the oldest and most basic sin, pride. McDonald said NASA had become too successful. They had gotten by for a quarter of a century and had never lost a single person going into space. And, if you remember, they had rescued the Apollo 13 halfway to the moon when part of that vehicle blew up. It seemed like it was an impossible task, but they did it when they rescued that space shuttle. So how could this O-ring cause a problem when they had done so much over the past years be successful? All of this success gives them a little bit of arrogance, but they hadn't stumbled yet, and they just pressed forward. They kept going because of pride. I heard of a man who once said he, owned a, he owed all his success to something he learned from his Dominic Rooster. The rooster was a powerful fighter. He could fly high and cut deep than any rooster in the neighborhood, but he often lost fights against weaker roosters because his trouble was that right in the middle of the fight, He'd stop to crow. Anytime we stop to crow about ourselves and lives, friends, we're headed for certain trouble because pride always comes before the fall. The question is, how do we keep from doing it? How do we keep from letting pride destroy our lives? Let's pray about that. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank, thank you for the beautiful sunshine coming through the windows here. Father, we're, we're, we're looking forward to spring, but... Uh, where the, where the temperatures will rise and uh, more people can get out and the, the ice will go away. We're looking forward to that, but we certainly love your beauty that you've created today. Father, I thank you for all those here today. I thank you for those on our Facebook Live page that are watching. And as we move forward, Lord, we, we continually pray that, uh, that you will give us a hedge of protection as we move forward in this community of, of Round Ted and Alger, McGuffey and Herod and Aiden, all the communities that we serve, Lord. We look forward to uh, continuing to, to show Jesus Christ to our, our, our communities. Watch over us, Lord. Speak through me in spite of my failures. Speak through me in spite of my flaws, Lord. And I pray you'll bless everyone here today, and especially those on our prayer list that are struggling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to Genesis 11. Let's look at Genesis 11, where the builders of Babylon demonstrate some of this self-made pride that I'm speaking of. Genesis 11. And God's word says this, Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain of Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they had begun to do this, then nothing they planned to do would be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they'll not be able to understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So let's look at what we have going on here in this scripture. How we look this up is, imagine an American hospital where the medical staff, the visitors, and all the patients wake up one morning speaking English. And then suddenly, a doctor expresses her thought in Vietnamese, and the nurse confusedly asks questions in Hungarian. Six strangers step off the elevator, excitedly babbling in Arabic, Chinese, Russian, Finnish, Portuguese, and Hindi. During surgery, suddenly everything's impossible. Emergency patients in the ER can't describe their symptoms. A daughter isn't able to ask questions about her elder, elderly father's medications. Experts can still read the MRIs and run laboratory tests, but they're not able to share their insight about the patients with other doctors. People can't even write notes in a common language. No one can voice their fears or shout a clear warning. Emotionally and mentally isolated, everyone's frustrations grow more intense and people start to panic. And gradually over the next week or two, every citizen in the whole city comes to understand the same painful truth. A displeased, all-powerful deity has flipped the switch in everyone's brain. 
and it changes their lives forever. The new language each person speaks is now permanently fixed. Does God dislike tall towers? What is this all about? Building a tower isn't sinful. After all, every major city in the world has several tall buildings. Back in 1883, the Chicago Daily Paper wrote an article called The High Building Craze. At first used the term skyscraper to refer to a very tall building. And the first skyscraper was 10 stories tall and 138 feet high. It opened in Chicago the following year. In contrast, New York's One World Trade Centers, completed 130 years later, is 104 stories tall and 1,776 feet high. So why did God interfere? Progress. Everything was going great. Why did God interfere? In verse 6, we have the Almighty's answers. Look at Genesis 11, 6 through 7. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they had begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they, will, so they will not understand each other. So why did the Almighty confuse everyone's speech? Why did he disrupt the completion of a tower of Babel? The reason why. I think God saw this. I think God saw that this major achievement would change the way people viewed themselves. Arrogance and selfish pride would start to grow once more in their human heart. And these sinful attitudes are often the beginning of a corrupt and wicked life. You see, evil people are usually full of themselves. Self-focused, stingy, completely without concern about anyone else. Now keep in mind, friends, Noah's flood had just rebooted the human race a few chapters before. And the high level of evil in mankind had been destroyed. But it could quickly begin growing again. So the Lord decided to disrupt the building project in Babel and bring it to an end. Now these people of Shinar that we talk about here later becomes known as Babylon, which is now current day Iraq. And all these people at that time are very proud and full of themselves. They're building a building to heaven. They don't need anybody's help. They were told to go out and populate. They're staying in their city and not moving. And God said, no, 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 we've got to stop that. They're proud of their own ingenuity. They're proud of their own intelligence. They're proud of their advanced technologies. And you say, advanced technologies? Think about this. They wouldn't dare use the old, outdated, inferior way. So where does that come from? They wouldn't dare just let the bricks dry in the sun, and they wouldn't dare use mud for mortar. Oh, no. You remember in the scripture it says they thoroughly, they're go to, going to thoroughly bake the bricks to make them harder. And they're going to use tar instead of mortar to make them stick together forever. Wow. We're going to use the latest technologies. Aren't we just the greatest? We're invincible because we've used the latest new technologies. Old sailors like to tell the story of the young sailor learning to become a navigator aboard a ship at sea. And the captain said to him, he says, please tell us where you are. So the sailor took a sextant and made the complicated set of calculations. And after a while, he wrote down the coordinates of longitude and latitude, and he handed it to the captain. The captain studied it for a while, checked his charts, and said to the young navigator, he said, are you absolutely convinced that these are the right coordinates? Yes, sir, he said, I'm absolutely convinced. You know exactly where we are? Yes, sir. There could be no conceivable mistake in your calculations, young man. Nope, absolutely not, sir. I've done my best. And the captain said, well, then I suggest you put on a jacket, sir. He said, because according to your calculations, we are planted squarely at the top of Mount Washington, nowhere near the body of water we're on. Now, just because you have ingenuity, friends, it doesn't mean you're intelligent. Just because you have the education, it doesn't mean you're smart. Just because you have technology, it doesn't mean you're wise. Because pride has a way at times to show us how we don't know as much as we think we know or how important we think we are. Vance Havner was an old Baptist preacher who had keen insight into our contemporary society. And he once said, of all the illusions and fantasies and face farces of human history, the biggest mirage of all is that we call progress. The biggest mirage is what we call progress. Just because we split the atom and are back from the moon, we think we've given God his walking papers. We've decided we can work out our own salvation and science has no answer to sin. Don't be so full of yourself. That makes you a fool out of all of us. Instead, we need to depend on the Lord's wisdom and power, not our own. 
And this is where I am as guilty. I depend on my own way. I can do this, God. I can take care of this, God. I don't really need you in this situation. I like the way I do it. And then it all crumbles apart. We need to lean on God's understanding. We need to rely on his insight, not our own. And second, if we want to keep from making a fool of ourselves, we rely on his strength and we trust in his might and not on our own. You remember, remember the movie Jurassic Park? The scientists are brought in and given a tour of the facilities. And the premise of the movie is that these scientists have been, been able to resurrect the dinosaurs and use their DNAs to recreate them. And they're so excited that they have resurrected a dead species. And there's an incredible line in that movie from Jeff Goldblum. And he says this. He said, it appears to me that you guys were so concerned with could you that you never considered the question of should you. Isn't that where we are as people? I know that's where I'm at. Considering not only can we, but should we. And this is an issue we face all the time in society today. Can we clone a human being? Can we build new buildings? And we need to ask both questions of the decisions we face in our lives. Not only can we accomplish the task, but should we accomplish the task? You see, we face complex issues in our society today, even in our own personal lives and in our own professional lives. In the last hundred years, we've seen nuclear technology, space exploration, and flight. And you could argue that all these things are helpful, but they can also be harmful. Today, we use flight to do God's work by placing missionaries in other countries or to take foreign aid to hungry people. Yet, flight has also added a new element of war. Nuclear power is safe and clean and provides more than a thousand oil refineries, but in the wrong hands, nuclear power could mean destruction and devastation. Today, we know that medicine to cure spinal cord injuries can be found in stem cells. Unfortunately, the majority of research comes from children who never had a chance to ask the question, should we? Questions for themselves. It's a tough question, isn't it? How do we know what is progress and what is something that should not be done? Because we've seemed to have been mistaken throughout history on many things which have made the world better. Sam Langley, he saw some birds flying in his hometown. And he started thinking about ways to be able to fly himself. And people said, you know what, Sam? If God wanted man to fly, he would have given him wings. Now, after he heard about Orville and Wilbur Wright, he designed an engine and he beat their flight record, which a lot of people don't know about. You see, resisting progress is not godly. But on the other hand, how do we determine the quest? How do we decide what God's will is? When you think of the greatest inventions and great strides throughout history, what do you think of? See, I believe that God wants the Christians to be the people who are, who are on the front edge of society. I believe God wants the Christians curing cancer. I believe God wants Christians inventing machines and new technology. I believe God wants Christians having breakthroughs in medicine. Christian nurses, Christian doctors, Christian farmers, Christian factory workers. I believe that all those are important in this world. But it's about trusting in God over trusting in human effort. Now that doesn't mean we don't work hard. But it does mean that when goals are reached that we know the world is a better place because God was with us and God was helping us perform the duties. And he gives the brain power. He gives us the ability. You see, today's Tower of Babel exists when we take on a project without consulting the wisdom of God in our lives. Let's be honest, it happens a lot. We've grown accustomed to knowing that there are some things we can do without God's help. We have to back up and ask these things we should do them. We know we can. Should we do them? We have to examine our motives. We all know what we're capable of, but we need to ask the question, why do I want to do this? You see, today the church needs lawyers. The church needs doctors and farmers and carpenters and teachers and factory workers and people in politics to defend Christianity and churches in this land. We must have a purpose in mind. And our goals will not happen if they're not God's goals. It won't happen without God. If we want to change the world for God, we can't do it ourselves. Proverbs 16.9 says, In the hearts, humans plan their course, 
but the Lord establishes their steps. And God many times asks us to reach for that which we can only find and which we can only reach for with him by our side. God desires to be partners with us as he shows us new technology. His desire to help us discover treatments for diseases. He desires to make the world a better place for him, not us at all, all the time. When we begin to think in terms of can and should we, we begin to approach life a little differently. And you'll find if you ask these questions that you may not be driven by personal motives, such as what will be easier or what will be the most profitable. You see, the most blessed people in the world get up every day and they try to make life better for the other 10 billion people in this world. And when today's children choose a career, what question do you want those children asking? Who will be the teacher? Who will preach the sermon? Who will attend to the sick? Who will ask, what should I do? You see, a lot of people already know the answer to the can I question. But the most important question has become, should I? Where are you today? Are you asking the can I question? Because the answer is yes. You can, if it's God's will, and if God will help. Can I speak to my coworkers about Jesus? Yeah, the answer is obvious. You can. The question becomes, should I speak to my friend about Jesus? Now, before you gasp, we all need to be comfortable sharing our faith. But have you done the groundwork? Do you need to build a relationship first? Are your friends open to the matters of faith? Have you looked at your scriptures to give an account of what you're thankful for? To give an account of what you believe in? Paul said sharing our faith is like farming a field. One plants, one waters, and God makes the whole thing work. Is the time right for you to invite that friend to church? When will the time be right? Should I? Could I? Can I? You see, these people in Shinar, they were not only self-ingenious people, they were self-reliant. In verse 4, they said, Let us build ourselves a tower and a city with its tops in the heavens, and let us make, what does it say here? Let us make a name for ourselves. So God was out of the picture. Let us make a name for ourselves. They're not only concerned about themselves making a name for themselves, reaching heaven by themselves, and they're so full of themselves, they think they can take God's place in heaven and that's not, like, that's not unlike a lot of people today. Many times we've done a lot of funeral dinners here. And we have the women and men who work so hard back here preparing our meals and serving our meals and knocking down tables and knocking down chairs and putting them up. And it gets tiring. And because I'm the face of the church, people often come up to me and say, hey, thanks for the, the, the meal. Thanks for the, setting this up. Thanks for doing this. Now I like to be, hey, hey, thank you, you're welcome. That's what I'm here for. Here we I guide them to the right people. No, these people did this. Carla did this. Randy did this. Clarabel did this. Everybody did this. It wasn't the preacher. That's hard sometimes because we like that pat on the back. We like that pat on the back. A newly elected congressman was visiting Washington, D.C. to get acquainted with his new colleagues. And he was visiting in the home of one of the ranking senators who was trying to explain the bizarre workings of the Capitol. And as they stood looking over the Potomac River, they saw an old deteriorating log floating by on the river. And the old senator said, this city is like that log out there floating. How's that, asked the new politician. Well, the senator replied, there are probably more than 100,000 grubs, ants, bugs, and critters on that old log as it floats down the river. And I can imagine every one of them thinks that he is steering that log. Now, how often do people think they're steering their own destiny? How often do people think they're in control when they're not? You know, heaven must look down and laugh sometimes because they know that only God is in control. They know that only God is the Lord of all. The Bible tells us in Psalms 24.1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The Bible tells us in Psalms 103, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdoms rule over all. Proverbs 19.21 says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. 
So what do those verses tell us? Very, very simple. God is in control and we're not. Not you, not me, not anyone else. God is in control. Dick Jones, he lived as if everything depended on him. One morning he woke up early with a high fever. His wife called the doctor who diagnosed viral pneumonia. The doctor suggested that Dick stay in bed for several days, but Dick complained. Nope, he said, I've got a breakfast meeting at school. I'm president of the PTA board. Then I've got a crucial business at the office, a luncheon date, and three very important appointments this afternoon. Tonight, there's the building committee meeting at the church. Doc, there's no way I can be sick today. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, said the doctor himself. The doctor said, I don't know anybody who is indispensable. He said, I suggest you stay in bed. At that very moment, as the story goes, Dick's high fever sent him into a trance. And Dick sees himself in heaven. And the angels are gathering around God and his holy throne, but everything seems to be in disarray. Some papers are being passed around, and finally, after much discussion, an angel passes an important-looking paper to God, and he reads it and is obviously upset. And God gets off his throne and says, Oh, no, oh, no, what are we going to do? What will I do? And the angels all together say, What is it, God? What's going on? And God says, What will I do today? Dick Jones is sick. You ever think that happens in heaven, friends? I don't. Do you ever think that happens in heaven? Because I certainly don't. God is not dependent on you and me. But we are very dependent on him. Now you cannot even take your next breath unless God says you can. So don't be so full of yourself that you make a fool of yourself. Instead, depend on the Lord's wisdom. And if you want to keep making a fool of yourself, you might want to start obeying the Lord. These people of Shinar, they were self-ingenious and they were self-reliant. And with the results, they were self-willed. Did you notice why they wanted to build a tower that reaches the heavens? In verse 4, they said, Come, let us build ourselves a tower with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we will make a name for ourselves. Yet in Genesis 9.1, in Genesis 9.1, God commanded them to fill the earth. So what's the big deal about that? Because if God asked them to fill the earth, that means to go and do his will. And they're staying and planting themselves and building a city. They think they know better than God. They think their way is better than God's, and so they disobey a clear command of God. They're not going to fill the earth, as God told them. They're going to build a tower so they can stay right where they're at. And sad to say, there are many people who live in open rebellion today. Oh, they have their reasons, which they think justify their sin, but they know what they're doing is wrong. I've been there. I've been there. They know God's clear command, and yet they do it anyway. That'd be me. In the summer of 1986, two ships collided in the Black Sea off the coast of Russia. Hundreds and hundreds of passengers died as they were hurled into the icy waters below. And news of this disaster was further darkened when an investigation revealed the cause of the accident. It wasn't technology problems like radio malfunction. It wasn't thick fog. The cause was human stubbornness and pride. Each captain in this investigation was found. Each captain was aware of the other ship presence nearby. But both could have steered clear. But according to news reports and investigation, neither captain wanted to give way to the other. Each one was too proud to yield first. And by the time they came to their senses, it was too late. You see, sometimes we hold on to our beliefs with the mistaken idea that we're taking a principal stand. Whereas we may be in error and in need of correction. And this type of pride shuns correction. It refuses to admit to wrongdoing and often results in our blaming others for our own mistakes. Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. You see, the key word in that is heart. Faith is a gift of the heart and not of the mind. Now, many of us know a lot about God, but unless that knowledge goes down to the heart, we never really will know God. And we see this exemplified in the arrogance of Saul. Remember Saul before he turned into Paul? He was a brilliant man. 
very highly educated. Saul knew the scriptures. He thought he knew God. But only when he was thrown off his high horse and met Jesus on the way to Damascus did he realize he didn't really know anything. And God blinded him and put him on his knees before he could look up. My friends, don't do what you know to be wrong. Even if you think I have a good reason to do it, that's how you get into trouble. That's how we end up making a fool of ourselves. A recently licensed pilot was flying his private plane on a cloudy day. He was not very experienced in instrumental landing, so when it came time to land, the control tower was, was talking him through the process. And then the, plight, the pilot got to thinking about all the hills, and towers, and buildings in the area, and he started to panic. And that's when a calm but stern voice said from the control tower, you obey the instructions. We'll take care of the obstructions. You obey the instructions. We'll take care of the obstructions. That's what God's saying to us every day, friends. You may think you have all kinds of reasons to disobey God, all kinds of excuses, all kinds of obstructions. But God says, just obey the instructions, and I'll take care of the obstructions. Trust him on that. Trust him on that. And don't be self-deceived. Don't be self-deceived. We'll think, you, you think, you will think you're something when you're nothing, as I've said, and you'll feel like you're standing firm before you fall. And that's what happened to the people of Shinar in our scriptures today. Even with all the ingenuity, even with all their independence, even with all their insubordination, they were no match for the Almighty God of the universe. And in this story, God's accomplished His will despite their rebellion. You see, here in America, we're proud of being proud. Proud of being proud. Well, you take a look at the magazine rack at any store checkout counter. Those magazines are plastered with pictures of people whose society says are beautiful, powerful, successful. They're not hiding their achievements or their abs. They're flaunting them. And consumers admire them. How many of our TV shows today are about ordinary people showing off their talents? Singing, dancing, surviving? Anything to grab 15 minutes of fame? A football player goes on a rant on a national TV taunting his opponents and declaring his superiority. And for the next two weeks, he's the most talked about player in sports. Pride seems to be working for these folks. So what's wrong? What's so deadly about it? The problem with pride from a biblical perspective is that it leaves God out of the picture, friends. It fails to recognize that God is great and worthy to be praised. And that any human achievement is possible only because of his grace and goodness. And pride pushes God off the podium. It has us believing that whatever good things we've attained or received in life are purely the results of our own achievements, our hard works, our good looks, our smart, our talent, our persistence. You see, we make ourselves the source of all good things. Talking earlier about the challenger. <clears throat> Excuse me. I lost my place there. Abraham Lincoln had this to say about pride. He said in a speech made in 1863, he said, We have been recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been, we have been preserved there many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers. We have grown in wealth and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us a peace and, and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined that we're on top. In the deceitfulness of our hearts, all these blessings we think were produced by us. In reality, they were produced by the Almighty God Himself. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. You see, pride's a subtle thing, friends. It sneak up on us. It doesn't appear overnight. It is born in years of small accomplishments that create in us an attitude of superiority. And I have to be checked on that myself at times. Pride comes before the fall when we focus more on things below rather than on things above. When we're more concerned with earthly things than we are with heavenly things. And every time we stand before God and sing, Holy, 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 we remember that He is God and we're not. 
Every time we stand and sing, in Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. We remember how loved and secure we are in Christ. Do you know what the difference between David Holbrook and God is? God doesn't think he's David Holbrook. He doesn't think he's me. But there are times when I believe I'm him in small, subtle ways, and that's not good. I want to close my message this morning with this. On October 3rd, 2003, Roy Horn celebrated his 59th birthday with more than 1,000 friends. And later that evening, he performed with his partner, Siegfried Fischbaugh, at the Mirage Hotel before an audience of 1,500 people. Now, since the late 60s, Siegfried Fischbaugh and Roy Horn's high-energy performance with wild animals has earned them such international reputation that you simply know them as Siegfried and Roy. About halfway into the performance that night, Horn appeared in the spotlight with a six-year-old white male tiger. It was a routine he had done hundreds of times. But for some unexplained reason, Horn slipped off stage, lost his footing, and it startled the 600-pound animal. And this 600-pound tiger lunged at Horn. In self-defense, the illusionist attempted to hit the tiger with his handheld microphone. The audience gasped as the tiger grabbed Horn by the neck and dragged him off stage like a limp rag doll. At that point, stage crew <clears throat> members used fire extinguishers to distract the animal and free Roy. And he, was, he was rushed to a local hospital where he underwent emergency surgery to save his life. In thousands of performances over 35 years, Horn had successfully evaded the dangers of his trade. But in an unexpected loss of balance, he lost his career and he nearly lost his life. And a few nights after the tragic accident, Larry King interviewed Horn's partner. And as Siegfried Fischbaugh attempted to explain what went wrong, two little words stood out as the primary cause. His words were, Roy slipped. Roy slipped. Friend, God's warn God warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. He says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. You see, the tigers in your life will take you down. And pride will destroy you unless you depend on the Lord to keep you standing. So look to him today and every day. Trust Christ with your life. Surrender your life to him so you can stand firm against the forces of evil in your own life. And as I said, don't be so full of yourself that you make a fool of yourself. If you would like to have Jesus in your life today, we ask you to come down front. Accept him here today. Repent of your sins. Have your sins washed in the water of baptism. You've heard the message. Come today. Come just as you are.
glory of your name to know the lasting joy even sharing in your faith and I morning. Uh, community meditation is titled My Fair Share. It comes from Psalms 103, 10, and 10 to 12. Sometimes we say, all I want is my fair share. All I want is what's coming to me. We all want the, to be treated fairly, don't we? We all want the proper change back when we buy something. If we find we have been shortchanged and didn't get what was coming to us, we become angry. We vehemently demand our rights. There's one area where I am glad we don't get our square deal and a fair shake. It's an area where I will never demand my rights and insist on what's coming to me. It's, all, it's, a, it's an area where I will forever remain silent and simply be thankful for what I got shortchanged. The area of which I speak is our sin. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us accordingly to our inequities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God does not treat us as our sins required or as we deserved. Our, serves, our sins were deserving of punishment. Instead, we received reward. We deserved death, but in its place, we received life. The one who deserved glory accepted our guilt. Jesus took our sins upon himself. Why? Love. Measureless love, 
that knows no limits was the reason. How far do the heavens reach? The heavens extend for untold millions of miles. If we can understand the limits of our universe, then we can understand God's love for us. I don't understand it, but I'm thankful for it. Our sins have been removed from our lives, never to be remembered again. When you travel towards the western horizon from the east, you never reach it. It simply stretches on before you, as far as the east is from the west. That is how far our sins are from us. Jesus made this possible. We remember these facts by participating in the Lord's Supper. May we honor the one who made it possible for us to get what we didn't deserve, forgiveness and eternal life. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for not giving us what we deserve. Thank you for taking our punishment on the cross. Thank you for making it possible for us to have eternity with you. Let us never forget that sometimes we shouldn't want our fair share. Amen. thankful today to meet together this morning Father in your name to hear another portion of your word we're thankful the reminder that uh, pride comes before fall Father just uh, so many of us just need to search our hearts just now we ask that you would also remind us that it's never wrong to do what we know is right Father just now we're going to be dismissed from this assembly we're going to, to walk along or try to endeavor to walk along the road that you would have us to go and Father, just for so many of us, that walk 
you know, just is not easy. Father, we just ask that you would help us to walk along until one day you give us wings. We just pray now that you would guide us to our separate homes, that you would help us to return, put a smile on, you know, on our faces, and maybe just a little spring in that step. Guide, direct, and be with us. Watch over us. For this would be our prayer this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Say it with me, folks. Love God, love people, share Jesus. Have a great week, everybody.